Are you wanting to move beyond being a tools and process improvement project doer to a transformational change leader? Find out how on this episode of Chain of Learning. Welcome to Chain of Learning, where the links of leadership and learning unite. This is your connection for actionable strategies and practices to empower you to build a people-centered learning culture, get results, and expand your impact so that you and your team can leave a lasting legacy. I'm your host and fellow learning enthusiast, Katie Anderson. Have you wanted to step into greater influence and impact in your role as an operational excellence or continuous improvement practitioner? Are you finding yourself being labeled as a tools and project person? Or perhaps you're a leader seeking to create broader organizational change, but don't quite know how. Today, I want to talk with you about your role as a transformational change agent and how you can step into greater impact by growing your leadership skills. One thing that we share as continuous improvement practitioners and leaders is a vision for a people-centered learning organization. We see the possibilities for the organizations we support and the people who work within them, but we're not always sure how to get our senior team to see this and to buy into this vision and the investment of time and effort to get there. And we're not sure how to position ourselves to be the catalyst of that transformation. That's what we're gonna tackle in today's episode, how to help you step into your impact as a transformational change leader to accelerate the rate of learning and high performance in your organization, no matter your title or role. To help create a bridge between where you might be today and how you will become an influential change catalyst, I wanna take you through a framework that I created about the eight foundational social skills to get there. I call it the change catalyst model with a K. Before we dive into the eight competencies in this model, I wanna give you a little backstory about how I came to some of these realizations and some of the trial and errors that I've had too in getting to be at the point of moving from being much more of a practitioner of continuous improvement, applying my technical skills to really helping lead transformational change as an internal change leader and now as a coach and a consultant to help other change leaders like yourself really step into that influence and power. So about two decades ago, I moved into consulting and continuous improvement roles in organizations after having a really successful first career in academia where I was rewarded for being an excellent problem solver as an independent contributor. And even in my early days in these continuous improvement roles, I loved being assigned going out to solve important problems. I thrived on it. And I really enjoyed seeing other people get excited about solving problems and giving them some skills and capabilities to do so. But really, I was driving the change. And I realized you know, over the course of several years that if I was the one sort of behind the scenes doing all the problem solving, of coming in and, and sharing my ideas and leading all of the improvement efforts, that I wasn't truly creating the capability within the organization of the leaders of different, the direct managers of the front line to continue to build on the changes, to lead it themselves. And I also realized that I wasn't being as influential with the executive team that I really needed to be if I wanted to be focusing on leading much broader change than just discrete projects. And I had a lot of ahas along the way, and I'm going to share some of those with you uh, in today's episode. And we're going to unpack some of those stories and lessons in future episodes too. But as I stepped into more senior leadership coaching roles and um, executive management roles, I learned a lot through trial and error. And I was fortunate to have some coaches and mentors from whom I learned a lot too. And I realized the importance of these core social skills. It wasn't about me always being the expert problem solver or pushing my idea through. It was about learning how to work within the intricate web of people that make up an organization to create the impact that I really wanted and the outcomes that I knew our organization needed as well. And so that's what really led me in the last several years to develop this model for my clients to help them have a more clear pathway to grow their skills and accelerate their ability for impact. And I wanted to make this model available for you too. 
This model really frames what some people refer to as the soft skills, which are really about people, power, and influence. And these are the core skills that you need to couple with your technical expertise to really, really have the impact that you want in your organization and for yourself. So high-performing organizations are made up these socio-technical systems, but we often focus more attention on the technical side, the tools, the processes, the techniques, the, the visible artifacts of improvement. But we need to balance this technical know-how with social competencies. And I've talked a lot about this in previous episodes of Chain of Learning, particularly the most recent episode with Gene Kim and Steve Spear in episode eight, Wiring the Winning Organization, and also in episode six, Behind the Lean Mindset, in my interviews and discussions with other transformational change leaders and executives from General Electric, from industries such as healthcare and services and more. It is these eight competencies that are the bridge between being a technical tool and project operational excellence expert with being a truly influential change leader that can foster learning cultures and create organizations of engagement and high performance. So back to the model, the catalyst model. It's all about being a catalyst, an agent of change, but one that accelerates learning. A few years ago, I was inspired to create a new word, a mashup of catalyst with C-A-T-A-L-Y-S-T, which is an accelerator in general, uh, an event or person that accelerates the rate of progress or change, and the Japanese word kata, K-A-T-A, which means different routines for problem solving and coaching. And kata is a Japanese word that means form or routine and is often associated in our continuous improvement circles with the practices that support problem-solving thinking and coaching for improvement. They're the routines and practices that we use for problem-solving and coaching for problem-solving. So if a catalyst is an event or person that accelerates the rate of progress or change, a catalyst with a K is someone who accelerates the rate of learning as a source of organizational progress and change. So a change catalyst is a continuous improvement leader like you who pairs your technical expertise with these eight social competencies in the catalyst model so that you can influence transformational change and create a thriving, people-centered, high-performing learning culture in your organization. And luckily for me too, the catalyst model aligns with my name and my initials KA. So an added bonus to that. The information and competencies in the Cautilus model are not just important for you and your career, which it is, but they are invaluable to your life, your team, your organization, and the legacy that you'll leave as you grow your chain of learning. It's really through learning these social skills where you can really influence the rate of learning in organizations, teams, and the people in your life that you really grow and develop and strengthen those around you. In the next episode, you'll be hearing from my client, Sean, who made this journey from a technical operational excellence expert to a senior transformational change leader and how the elements of this model gave him a superpower that helps him in every aspect of his leadership and his life. His growth in these areas has allowed him to make powerful impact in his organizations and its movement towards a people-centered learning organization. We're going to walk through the Cautilus model here on this episode of Chain of Learning, but to help you learn about the model at a deeper level and to identify which of the competencies you've mastered and where you have opportunities for growth, I also have the Cautilus self-assessment available to you to download on my website. So head over to either kbjanderson.com to download it. And it's also linked in the show notes on this episode's page, chainoflearning.com slash nine. So get ready to transform yourself into a highly influential change leader who accelerates the rate of learning and impact in your organization. It's time for us to dive into the Cautilus model. So without further ado, let's get into the eight competencies. All right, so number one, is K of Cautalist being a knowledgeable business expert. 
This is about being able to fluently speak the language of business and connecting the dots between your continuous improvement expertise and technical knowledge and the business results that the executive team needs to get. So whether you are using Lean or Agile or Six Sigma tools or other approaches, being a transformational change catalyst demands more than just your expertise in your chosen field or your functional discipline. It requires an intimate understanding of your organization's value creation mechanics and the metrics of success. You are amazing at solving problems and applying the tools and the technical side of being an operational excellence doer, but being a knowledgeable business expert is about then being able to explain all of this, all the reasons why you might be applying those tools or the technical lingo in a way that your operational leaders in the business understand. It's about dropping the jargon in the lingo where the eyes glaze over in the meetings to really connecting the dots of the business, being under, able to understand you know, what are the real business drivers and in inputs and data so that you can really help the executives understand why you might be applying some of these process improvement technical skills. So, you know, I was thinking about how I could give an example of this because, you know, there's so many times that we use, we use continuous improvement or uh, lingo or Japanese terms or acronyms like Daimaic and others that really people don't understand. So we need to speak in simple terms and really connect it with what's important in the business. So you, you might say something like, we need to integrate a Kamishi by board into our Haichunka and Kanban systems to minimize Muda while concurrently detecting Hosh and Conry misalignments. Like, what does that mean? I mean, you know what that means. But maybe if you said something like this, like to your executive team, if we create a visual system to really understand workflow and that we integrate this with how we are leveling our work schedule and creating visible connection between steps, we will be able to streamline processes, ensure a more steady workflow, and eliminate waste, resulting in reduced cost increased employee satisfaction, and better alignment with our long-term goals to deliver on customer needs. Okay. And another example that I've seen a lot too is when people have moved industries. In fact, uh, one of my clients that I was working with in the last year had moved from healthcare to a totally different industry. And he realized after going through this Catalyst self-assessment that he needed to spend a little bit more time going and learning about the details of the organization. If he was truly going to be influential in coaching and working with the executive team to create change. Now, this doesn't mean that he had to become the full technical expert in everything about this industry, but it's really being able to understand the data, the drivers, and speak that language that's going to be meaningful to the executives. I've also seen people when I worked in healthcare Maybe they were working in manufacturing and, and it was so easy for them to like see processes, but then we're using manufacturing terms and this didn't connect with the physicians and nurses that they were trying to coach and work with as well. So know the people you're working with and use language that's really going to connect those principles to the work that they do and the results and outcomes they need. So that is what it means to be a knowledgeable business expert. So what about you? On a scale of one to 10, where 10 is, this is a strength, and one is, wow, I really don't have a clue. How well are you able to speak the language of business fluently and connect the dots between your continuous improvement or operational excellence expertise and things like employee effectiveness, customer satisfaction, and other business results? So reflect on that for a moment, and also be sure to go over and download the Cautilus self-assessment so you can go through this at the same time. Where are you on this opportunities for growth and improvement. All right, let's move on to the second element of the Cautilus model. This is A, an analytical systems thinker. Being an analytical systems thinker is about having the ability to see how all the pieces of the organization fit and work together. It's about understanding the upstream and downstream impacts of what you recommend. It's about solving problems that are on the level of cause and effect and really understanding what a real problem is. Like what's the target? What's actually happening? What's that gap that needs to be closed? And it's about helping others in the organization, especially the senior team, see this as well. So moving beyond their functional silo that they can get really focused on and are responsible for, 
to really see the bigger picture in the interconnection of all of the different functions within the organization. This is what really makes you so special in your role as a change leader because you can help create this big picture connection. This is really that systems thinking. And the more that you can help operational leaders see and connect the dots, you will be so much more impactful and effective. So there are many ways that you can show up to really connect the dots for leaders and really help focus on effective problem solving. One is help leaders resist the urge to jump into action. Help them take a step back to understand truly the problems that need to be solved and go through a structured problem solving process. And this is not about you always jumping in and doing the problem solving, but how are you guiding them through this and helping them connect the dots and really define the problems that need to be solved. Other transformational change leaders talked about the importance of going to Gemba and helping leaders go to Gemba to go see and walk the process back in episode seven. And this is so critical to see that interconnection. Going to see can be so powerful in helping connect the dots across silos in an organization. One of the most memorable times for me in doing this as a transformational change leader was when I was working at a children's hospital and there was a huge problem that the pediatric cancer center had been dealing with for years. And it was making everyone so upset the parents and their very sick children who had to come in multiple times a week for infusions or chemotherapy, the doctors, the nurses, everyone was so upset. Patients were waiting hours on end, unpredictably, not just like one or two hours, but sometimes five, six hours. We called it lost in the system because literally there was a few patients that were you know, there for like eight, nine hours. And this was happening multiple times a week through, you know, for everyone. The first step that I did was to help break down the silos. There'd been a ton of problem solving going on, but I said, let's go walk the process together. And so I gathered a team of physicians, executives, um, nurses, nurse practitioners, and some clinicians or the clinic staff. And we walked the entire process. And in doing so, their eyes opened up in seeing wow, this is what actually happens here. This is the interconnection between different roles. They were also caught up in their functional areas and had been doing microprocess improvement initiatives, but not looking at the whole system. So it may not seem like a big deal to you because it seems second nature, but help leaders and operators get out of their silo and go see the whole system and connect the dots. This is one of your superpowers that you can put into place as an analytics systems thinker. All right, so take some reflection again too on this element of the Cautilus model. On a scale to one to 10, of 10 being a strength and one being no clue or just getting started, how well are you able to see the different parts of the organization and see that they're interconnected? And to use this perspective to not only map out processes, and systems to define actual problems and root causes, to develop solutions that address these underlying issues, and to bring leaders along in connecting the dots between the silos. All right, let's move on to element number three, which is the T in Catalyst, tactical strategic aligner. Being a tactical strategic aligner, it's about being able to align the concepts of continuous improvement with the mission, vision, and goals, both long-term and short-term, of the organization, and being able to articulate how continuous improvement, process improvement, operational excellence, agile, whatever you want to call it, enables the achievement of these goals and is part of the overall strategy. And this is also about you helping align and prioritize initiatives with these goals and values for maximum impact and developing the plans to get there. So being a tactical strategic aligner is also very much connected with being a knowledgeable business expert and a systems thinker. So these elements all kind of work together as well. One thing I see all the time, this is back from when I was working internally organizations and all the coaching and consulting work that I do too, is that organizations and their leaders are burdened by the number of initiatives and projects and strategies and things that they're doing that senior teams don't know where to focus. One of the ways that you can help with this and help get the focus is starting to make things visible. For example, 
in my last internal consulting role, I worked with my executive partner who was the COO of this large healthcare system. And we plastered with my team the walls of a huge giant conference room with so much butcher paper and put lines of all different categories of the different areas across the system, both the functional categories and physical locations and everything. And we had the senior leadership team and their direct reports. So all the VPs and above put down all the initiatives that they had on their individual plates for the next 18 to 24 months and put sticky uh, notes up there, plus marking all the different functional areas of support that they would need. And this visualization was filled with color and stickies, and it was overwhelming of how much work there was in the system. Making it visible in a very physical way allowed this senior leadership team to see how overwhelmed the system was. And it forced conversation for them to make tough decisions on where to focus, what were truly the things they needed to do to move the needle as a broader organization, and then what projects they needed to kill or say not now to because in the service of the overall organizational good of where they needed to go and how that really fit with the overall mission, vision, and values of the company. And being able to help the senior leadership team align on these priorities and then also understand how the business outcomes that they want and need will be enabled by continuous improvement and a learning culture and all the things that you can see are possibilities too. So starting to make that connection, but also freeing up the space for them to focus on the key things that are going to drive the business forward, both from an outcomes perspective, but also the cultural behavioral elements that are going to do that as well. So back to reflection, think about this element of being a tactical strategic aligner and rate yourself on a scale of one to 10 about how well do you help your leadership team align the work with the organization's mission, vision, and values? And how well are you able to really articulate a culture of continuous improvement and how that supports these goals? All right, on to competency number four, astute political navigator. Being an astute political navigator is about being able to maneuver the political system of an organization and understand how power actually flows, which is not always what you see on the org chart, so that you can influence the real decision makers and build coalitions to support and get buy-in for your ideas. So you could have the best idea or plan and, and, and really see where this is going to go and what can happen, but it will get eaten by politics every day if you don't know how to navigate the intricate web of people in power. So where are the meetings before the meetings? This is politics. When is the CEO looking at someone else on her team before making a decision? That's that influential person. This is politics. You have to be able to read the informal power structures and leverage it to be able to influence the change that you see is so important and is possible. There's a Japanese term called nemawashi, which means tilling the soil. It's all the meetings before the meetings. It's about getting the input before coming to the actual decision. You could also call this getting your fingerprints on it. It's this concept of shopping around your idea or your project plan before presenting it at a meeting. This is why when we practice A3 thinking for problem solving or strategy development, you want to take your document around and ask people for their input, literally get their fingerprints on it. And it highlights, you know, some of the things that maybe you weren't even thinking of. And the power is when you then go into a meeting, you can highlight the the things other people contributed to this. So really showing their input can influence the power and the decision making and make sure you've identified who those key people are that will influence those change decision makers as well. Another example I find sometimes a challenge for CI practitioners is when you are taking the lead on a project and you start like running with it, but you haven't really gotten the support of an executive sponsor, it can feel like to the process owner that you're pushing your ideas and your agenda through without it really being connected to the uh, importance within the organization or what their boss wants as well. So make sure you get the input in 
any project or initiative before you sort of keep running and moving forward. So time for some reflection. Where are you on a scale of one to 10 with being a astute political navigator? How effectively do you navigate complex political environments, build coalitions of support, and influence decision makers? All right, we're halfway through. On to number five. This competency is about being a lifelong learning enthusiast. And you're listening to this podcast because you, like me, already are a learning enthusiast who seeks to learn, grow, and improve, and help other people do the same. But even more than your own personal growth, being a learning enthusiast is about approaching all people in situations with curiosity. It's about being open to feedback, but it's more than that. It's about taking it in and adapting your approach based on this. In my book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, the Leading to Learn framework of leadership is about setting direction, providing support, and developing yourself. And that developing yourself part is so critical to really being able to step into greater influence and impact. No matter what skills we've developed, there's always opportunity to keep learning and growing and improving no matter the situation. So in the last episode, episode eight, Jean Kim asked me what was a big leadership shift that I had to make to become more effective. And I shared a story where my coach gave me feedback that was really hard to hear. She said that I was interrupting my team and jumping in with my ideas instead of listening to them. I was literally like a lion on my team, just like crouching in, taking over, you know, when they were least expecting it. And I was shutting them down. And, and instead of fostering their input and their creativity, I was just being the dominant voice in the meeting without intending to do so. I really wanted to hear their voices, but my enthusiasm was getting in the way. So that was really hard to hear, but it was so important and helpful. I realized I had a telling habit and it was getting in the way of me having the impact that I wanted. But because I'm a lifelong learner, I heard it. I reflected on it. I practiced what the Japanese call hansei or self-reflection and made some intentional, simple adjustments that had a dramatic impact. And I'll be talking more about this in future episodes too, because it's so fundamental to how we need to become better leaders and the simple shifts that we can make to really have greater impact. So reflect on this element too, on a scale of one to 10 and use this assessment as your foundation. How experienced are you in asking for feedback and making adjustments to your approach based on what you've learned and modeling this behavior for others? Competency number six is the why in Catalyst, yes-minded persuader. This isn't about having sales skills or even persuasion and influence skills. It's about motivating others to take action, including the senior team on what's in their best interest. It's not just about your agenda or you being right. And I'm sure you have a ton of fabulous ideas as I always do, but it's about how your recommendations support their agenda, the business results that they need and want, and how you bring them along on a journey to see how these ideas serve these outcomes. Being a yes-minded persuader is directly connected to some of the other skills that we've talked about here in the Caudalist model, such as being a knowledgeable business expert and a tactical strategic aligner. In my late 20s, I was working in a consulting organization, and I had just made this shift from academia, where I really was truly an independent contributor, to being an independent contributor, yet being a consultant working with organizations. And I loved it. I learned a lot at that time in my life, and I am still now, I'm very passionate and energetic about ideas, especially ideas I think are good ones. And I'd come forward very forcefully sometimes in meetings to advocate for my ideas, thinking that this might be the best approach to get people energetically excited as I was about what I was saying. But my boss told me that I was like a bull in a china shop. And I was a bit appalled um, and horrified by this and, and a little put off. But at the same time, I realized that, oh my gosh, maybe me being so enthusiastic about my position and forcefully sharing it in meetings and being focused on my agenda was actually having the opposite impact that I wanted to. And so 
I really worked on how could I better listen to what other people were saying so that I could then connect the dots on some of my ideas and maybe create alignment for them. One of the things that has been really powerful in the work that I've done in myself, but also in the, the leaders that I coach in making this shift to more impactful transformational leadership is about having the skills to help executive team members articulate the outcomes and results that they need and reflecting perhaps on their own current behaviors and how effective they are. So if you're trying to like convince the leadership team that they need to go out of their office and start seeing or more ask more questions, how can you help them see how a change in behavior might be more effective in getting to the results that they need? And I'm often asked about how can you coach someone that doesn't think that they need to improve or people who are quote unquote resisting change? This concept of motivational interviewing about asking people questions to help them identify the outcomes they want, understand their concerns, and then helping them address their concerns is really part of the same concept of persuasion and helping people understand the connection to their agenda. So this is such a critical skill if you want to truly be influential in your organization and with the people you work in. So reflect on your skills as a yes-minded persuader on a scale of one to 10. How effective are you at using active listening and empathy, persuasive language and compelling arguments to help others adopt a new way of thinking and working and making movement towards a vision? Competency number seven in the Cautilus model is skillful facilitator. Being a skillful facilitator is about how you command a room as a workshop leader, a work session facilitator, a retreat convener. It's about how you engage audiences to take action, whether it's learning and applying a new skill or coming to an agreement. And this is about reading the room, creating the structures that will help support conversation, learning, practice, and more. And I have been so fortunate to have learned from several really amazing facilitators that I'm going to have some of them on the show here so where we can unpack some of these skills more deeply. And these facilitation skills have been invaluable to the work that I do, not only in the consulting work that I do, but the, the leading executive retreats, helping executive teams come to decisions and also improving their skills for practice. Just a few months ago, I was on site with a client in Europe, and I was leading a multi-day workshop that was teaching executives about how to have some of these skills about learning to lead, leading to learn, how do you ask questions, how are they setting better direction, all of these things. And I was also working with the internal continuous improvement team behind the scenes about how they could up their facilitation skills as well. And one of the comments that I got back was like, wow, you really had a strong structure for how you were leading people through the day. And I said, yes, that is our role as a facilitator. We create the conditions for learning and practice. So that's the thing that we're in there facilitating the structure that is going to get to the outcomes that they need for whatever that the purpose is. It's coming to an agreement, having a learning moment. And my clients told me that one of the things they realized is that they give too much um, looseness. They allow the people in the workshop to sort of make decisions about what they want to practice or, you know, what is the competency they want to work on, where I was very structured on, this is the thing you're going to practice. You have this amount of time. Here's the structure. You're going to do it. And the leaders obeyed <laughs> and they went through it. It's just like a coach. So in some ways you are that facilitator that owns the structures for the learning and the practice. You also have the responsibility to call out things like making sure that people, everyone is speaking to um, make visible the elephant in the room. And all those things are really important aspects of being a facilitator. So there's so much more we can dive into, and this is going to be the focus of many more episodes as well. So I can't wait to dive into with more details and like specifics to really help you step into greater facilitation skills. So think about for yourself, though, where are you right now? in the attribute of being a skillful facilitator. On a scale of one to 10, 
How effectively do you facilitate organizational meetings, training programs, or workshops that engage audiences and achieve desired outcomes? And last but not least, we are on to competency eight, T in the Catalyst model, transformational coaching leader. If you've been in my world for a while, you have heard me talk about break the telling habit, and this is where that concept fits in. And this is part of what the feedback was from my coach that I really had to take on and make some improvements on when I was shutting down my team and interrupting. This is about how we move from being an expert to being a coach and the continuums you have to navigate, whether or not you are in an operational leadership role or you're in a role called coach, if your responsibility in that moment is to help someone else solve a problem, take responsibility, to come up with some thinking or to learn, your role is not to be the expert with all the answers. It's to be coaching and developing and teaching others to do that. And there's so many different things that we can do along this coaching continuum. And coaching isn't always just about asking open questions. It can also be holding up the mirror to someone on their behaviors. It can be speaking uncomfortable truths with respect. Uh, It can be teaching and helping someone learn a new skill. So it's all of these things. It's about never taking away the responsibility for learning from the other person and also labeling what you're doing so that you model the way for others. So for this last competency, being a transformational change leader, how would you rate yourself on the scale of one to 10 about your ability to coach and mentor others to develop their leadership skills, to inspire and motivate their teams to manage change and lead by example? So how effective are you in not being the content expert but rather the coach that's helping other people develop their expertise. So those are the eight competencies of the Catalyst model. And I encourage you to go download the assessment for yourself so you can continue to go back through this and create a plan of improvement for yourself. Your company needs you to step into being a transformational change leader, not just a projects and tools doer, and how you can help your leaders and your organization create a culture of learning and innovation and continuous improvement. And to get there, you need to be able to pair your persuasion, your influence, your coaching, and your communication skills with your technical know-how, which is super important as well. So I'm not saying to forget about the technical side, but you also need to be growing these social skills as well. The eight competencies that I went over in the Catalyst model Is your knowledge and skills bridge and mastering them will not only transform your leadership, but your organization, your career, and your life. So continue your reflection and go download the Change Catalyst self-assessment. The direct link, again, is on the episode page, chainoflearning.com slash nine, or on my website, kbjanderson.com. Take the assessment and reflect and be honest with where you're at. You're a learning enthusiast just like me, so identifying new learning and growth is fun and is an opportunity for you to continuously improve and step into greater impact. So download the assessment and reflect on this podcast episode as well. Identify just one competency that you wanna focus on for the next three months and make real progress on that one. And if you or your team need support from someone like me, I'd love to help you grow into being catalysts who accelerate the rate of learning as a source of organizational progress and change in your company. If you want to hear the impact of getting this transformational change superpower from someone just like you, you'll want to be sure to tune into the next episode where I talk with my client, Sean, who will tell you about his leadership evolution from being an operational excellence expert to a true transformational change leader. And in future episodes, we're going to be diving into each of the eight competencies in the Catalyst model in more detail and talking with other leaders about the changes they have made personally so that they can really make change organizationally to create these cultures of learning and build their chain of learning in their organizations. So be sure to follow or subscribe now and share this podcast chain of learning with your friends and colleagues so that we can all strengthen our chain of learning together. 
Thanks for being a link in my chain of learning today. I'll see you next time.